Okay, British and American culture. Um, this is another lecture that will um, lead right into a quiz. So um, it's going to be probably pretty detailed and you, you're going to have to pay attention. Uh, I'm going to try and simplify some really complicated uh, events um, in a way that you can understand and we'll focus on the, the ideas and the events and the people and how they're related. Uh, the main purpose of this course is for you to understand um, that the things that are developing, the things that are happening uh, throughout the periods we've discussed so far uh, are directly related to our culture today. In fact, uh, if things had gone differently during the 16th century, uh, who knows what the world would look like. It's, a, it's another one of those counterfactual situations, but this is one of the reasons why History is the study of everything, and that there's a lot of history in this culture course. But you'll probably find today and in the next couple lectures that I'm just jumping around, connecting people, places, events, decisions, and ideas uh, to each other to get this idea of what uh, an English culture is and how it's becoming something we can recognize. So what happened last class is we sort of talked about this very, very powerful, um, dangerous, powerful, intelligent, uh, important, and, uh, you know, stubborn individual named Henry VIII, who, through his own personality, forced his uh, culture into a revolution. Now, some of these things were going to happen an anyway, as I pointed out, but since Henry never took care of his body um, or his, his health, or anyone else for that matter. He just uh, lived his life in, uh, at full speed until everything fell apart. Um, he died and he, hen he ended up with three children. So let's, let's recap briefly about our, our uh, I shouldn't say our friend, our main focus, Henry VIII. Probably if you're living uh, during his period, you would have been as terrified of him as everyone else. Um, so Henry VIII, was a young man, very promising, grew into a tyrant, and things, basically, things never went his way. Like I said, all the potential he had um, didn't, wasn't completely realized, and he was probably frustrated, that, as he knew, as an intelligent and, and powerful and important person, that he wanted to achieve great things. For example, win wars in France and um, have a healthy male child. Those were two of his main goals, but he was unable to do that. So in his great frustration, uh, he took it out on everyone around him. Um, so the, the result was him coming up with solutions to his main problems, uh, having a male child and uh, having better control over his state and gaining more influence in Europe. So the main way that that played out was he decided to reform the church. Um, he needed to do this because his wife was older than him and she had only given him a daughter, Mary, and that was not good enough. So when he tried to divorce her, um, the Pope refused. So he decided to make his own church. Now, there was multiple benefits to this. One, he, there's, there's about four reasons for um, Henry VIII's decision here. Uh, he has financial problems because he does things like expensive wars and he spends a lot of money on himself, on his court, and building uh, projects and building ships. Uh, he doesn't have a, a low budget, so he's short on money. Um, he's spent most of the money his frugal father, Henry VII, saved up already. So when he separates from the Catholic Church, first of all, he gets the divorce that he wanted so he can marry Anne Boleyn. Second of all, he gets possession of the, all the church land, so he gets a huge amount of money, which he needs. Thirdly, um, he gets the political power. He doesn't have to, he declares that England is an empire, even though it sort of isn't anymore, although it was uh, hundreds of years before. Um, he declares that it's um, an imperial land and that um, they have sovereignty over themselves and nobody else has jurisdiction over English national law. So the Pope has no power anymore. They take away the Pope's, you know, religious laws and their, their ability to be enforced in England. So now it's a, an imperial state where Henry VIII is both 
the religious leader, and the political leader. So that's three. And then the fourth reason, I think this may be the weakest reason, but I still think it counts, so I'm going to include it. Because if it wasn't Henry VIII, we'll see this with other kings, and we've seen it already. You know, Edward the Confessor just didn't have kids and then died and let Harold Godwinson take over. And then, you know, William came over and killed him. And all, there's all kinds of situations where kings are weak. And when they die... Uh, or when they may, don't make decisions, somebody else tries to kill them. That's the whole thing about the War of the Roses before Henry's uh, father takes control of the, the uh, English crown. The, the War of the Roses, there's um, three different lines of kings, and I think only two out of seven kings die naturally. There's a whole bunch of kings that get um, killed in battle, or assassinated, or removed, or or um, um, there's coups between, this is what life was like 100 years before. Uh, and everybody remembers that. So Henry is the type of person who's not gonna let that happen. He, he knows that if he doesn't have a strong um, successor, and he doesn't want it to be a woman because he doesn't want, in that day and age, they thought a woman would be weaker and someone would be able to be uh, taking taken uh, advantage of, which we will find out shortly. That's not true. But this is what everybody believed, that they needed a son. He needed a son. So the son wasn't there. Uh, that didn't work out. He is ve very egotistical. He doesn't believe it's his fault. In, in fact, he doesn't even believe it's, uh, you know, um, God's, God's fault. He, he, can't, he doesn't take responsibility for anything. It's um, part of, I think... Uh, this type of person, and you may recognize this type of person in other leaders, maybe some other leaders that are, you know, presidents or, or dictators right now, you may notice this, that they never apologize for anything. It's never their fault. They, they never, even though they are ultimately the leader, um, there's always blame to be placed on someone else. They never do anything wrong. Henry VIII is this, ty this type of person. If something goes wrong, um, someone is blamed, he usually executes them. So not surprisingly, his ego is the fourth reason that this happens. He can't apologize. Literally, the Pope writes a letter uh, to Henry and says, don't divorce her. Don't divorce queen, the queen. Just, you know, get a concubine. Other kings do it. Just, you know... Put her in a castle somewhere and ignore her and I'll pretend it didn't happen and, and don't worry about it. Just do it under the books. But because of his pride and his ego, he says, no, I want her divorced. I want the marriage annulled and I want a new queen, an official queen. Uh, and, and the Pope says, I can't do that. And so then there's the schism. So that's the English Reformation. Initially, it doesn't really have a big effect because like I said, remember, uh, Henry himself is Catholic. There's lots of people running around in England who are Protestant, but he is Catholic. So let's get to the point where Henry dies. So Henry dies, well, let's not do that first. Excuse me. <laughs> let's, let's have a few more children first. Catherine of Aragon is divorced. He marries Anne of Boleyn. Anne of Boleyn has a, has a baby. It's a girl, disappointed. That's not how the history stories say it. They're like, oh, great, it's Queen Elizabeth is born. No, he was super disappointed. He wanted a boy. He got a girl. But okay, she had a baby. It's alive. Let's try again. She miscarried a couple boys. It's not working. Anne is super Protestant, actually. Um, and Henry is not. He starts to get annoyed with her, basically. And he, he, then he, the romantic relationship falls apart and then he accuses her of, her of cheating and then he decides that she needs to go too. Um, so he has her charged for a crime and executes her. So that's wife number two. He falls in love with one of Anne's ladies-in-waiting. Her name is Jane Seymour. He marries her very quickly and she has a boy. So he's ecstatic and then she dies. So he loves, he loves the fact that he has a boy, obviously um, very short marriage, and he was in love with Jane, but she's gone. Um, so then he has to, he has his boy, he has two girls and a boy from three different wives, 
But anyway, he tries again um, with three other women. Um, the, the next one also gets executed for cheating. Uh, the fifth one comes from Germany and he doesn't really like her, so he sends her back. And the sixth one um, sort of just takes care of him until he dies. And that's the, the six wives of Henry VIII. One of the many reasons why he's basically the most famous king in English history, because what a drama that is, right? It's just, it's begging to be a soap opera. Okay, so now you know the whole story about Henry VIII, but the point is his children. Okay, the birth order is Mary first, then Elizabeth, then Edward, but Edward is the male. So when Henry dies, he becomes the king. Now this is the important thing. I'm going to talk about the difference between the Christian types of the Protestant side and the Catholic side. So stay with me here. Edward is Protestant. Okay, he was raised by his family, um, the Seymour family. And they were Protestant, so he was raised Protestant. Mary was born first. She's much older. And she was raised by her Spanish mother. And uh, Henry was not really interested in her, so he just ignored her. So she got a sort of classical lady education. And she learned four or five languages. Um, th all, of these, all of these children and their parents are extremely smart, especially linguistically. Um, they all speak four or five languages, just like Henry VIII and Henry VII. So she's extremely Catholic, and, and she doesn't like what her father did at all, because her mother was Spanish, and her Spanish side are all Catholic too. Um, so she's Spanish. Elizabeth is sort of in between, uh, most leaning to the Protestant side though, but she's kind of isolated, and she's third in line anyway, right? Because it's going to be... Uh, she was made first once her mother was divorced, but then when uh, Anne, her, her mother was executed, she became third in line. So she's not likely to become any uh, leader anyway. So first we have Edward, and he was raised by the Seymour, so he's very Protestant. Unlike his father, who his father liked the Catholic Church, he just wanted to be the leader. But when Edward became king, who was only nine years old, he needed an older person to run the country. So the Seymour family, the, his uncle, and those people, they ran the country and they pushed the Protestant uh, style of Christian religion uh, harder, right? So for the five or six years that Edward VI um, is the boy king, um, England becomes more and more Protestant, and they start getting rid of the Catholic stuff more and more. All of the candles and the ceremonies and uh, the fancy buildings and the, the structure with the bishops and everything, they start removing a lot of these things. Um, the holidays start to be less festival and everything starts to be toned down in a Protestant way. But then uh, Edward gets sick and probably some sort of lung infection we think might be tuberculosis, and he dies. When he dies, his sister, the older sister, Mary, the half-Spanish Mary, she becomes Queen Mary. Now, there's a brief struggle between um, Edward's cousin, uh, another Seymour, and her, but um, Mary wins. And she actually, she is regal, intelligent, uh, savvy, uh, decisive, and she's extremely Catholic, and she's extremely loyal to her husband, who becomes uh, King Philip of Spain, uh, and the Spanish in general. So there's a strong, strong connection between Spain and, and England. And what she tries to do is she just tries to roll back everything. She just tries to turn England back into a Catholic state, but it's too late or she doesn't have enough time. She's trying to do it, but a lot of people are resisting her. And when they resist, she, she makes them recant. She makes them um, um, apologize and pray for forgiveness and convert um, to Catholicism. And if they don't, she burns them. So she gets this nickname, Bloody Mary, because the main thing that people remember from her period of, of rule is the fact that um, after Edward started pushing the country in the Protestant direction, um, 
she tried to make it Catholic again and people resisted. So if they resisted too strongly and they, they wouldn't follow what she um, insisted on, she killed them. All right. She put them in jail and she killed them. Uh, and this is where she gets the nickname Bloody Mary. Uh, one of the reasons that people didn't want to go back to the Catholic way of doing things was simply because Henry VIII took the church land and he took the money by selling it to rich people. Those rich people uh, now own the former Catholic land. And one of the things that they didn't want to do was give that land back. So approximately 20% of all the, the good land in England belonged to the church. And um, Henry took all of that and, and made it part of the, the royal um, possession. And to make more money, he sold pieces of it off to wealthy, you know, um, upper class nobles. And all, so now all these nobles who are the people who are running the country, they actually, they don't want to, a lot of them that got some of that land are not really super keen about giving that land back to the church. So they're, they're kind of Protestant for personal and uh, financial reasons as much as you know religious or spiritual reasons but it doesn't matter there's a lot of resistance to it but she's starting to make progress in some sense when she gets sick and uh, she has i think it's it's a stomach problem and it may have been cancer and she dies so suddenly there's this 25 year old woman who's been locked in the tower because mary has been worried about her potentially you know raising a Protestant army to fight against her. She's been locked safely in the tower. Suddenly her sister, her older sister suddenly dies, um, gets sick and dies. And now they march Queen Elizabeth out and she's the queen, 25 years old. Surprise. So this is where the information about the Reformation becomes key. So in your textbook, there is a kind of a breakdown. So I want to explain how Elizabeth approaches this because she is a Protestant queen, but in a way she's just more interested in everybody, but in everybody uh, getting along. Like this is a at the point that Mary dies, it's been, you know, a whole generation of people fighting over whether we should be Catholic or not, or a little bit Catholic or or less Catholic, and what the rules should be. So what she really wants to do is just get society functioning normally again and not have these constant political and violent confrontations based on these beliefs. So, you know, Martin Luther was the one who kick-started the, Re uh, the Reformation with his, um, the, his theses that he nailed to the door of a, a church in Germany. And um, so I'm going to just talk to you. These are the core ideas of both sides. So just think of like the main ideas of both sides. But there's more extreme Catholics and, and more moderate Catholics. And, Catholics, and there's more radical uh, Protestants and less radical Protestants. And the Protestants are a new resistance to the main church. So they, send, they tend to break up into different factions and fight each other even more. So for now, until next week, so don't worry about this on the quiz, but we are going to talk about there's different Protestant groups that fight each other. It's not just Protestant versus Catholic. It, it, soon, it soon becomes Catholic versus Protestants versus all kinds of different versions of Protestant. Okay, I know that's starting to get complicated, but we're not going to go there yet. This is just basically what happens. We're going we're gonna to say, okay, everybody is it basically in this circle is Protestant and you have varying versions of that and everybody who's the original Catholic Church, this is the way they do it. So let's do Catholic first. On page 93, uh, on 94, it explains all of this to you. I'm just going to read the bullets, which are the main points, so you can prepare. Make sure you highlight this, circle it, uh, even memorize it because these are going to come up they're essential to understanding this part of the course. So what, what the core ideas of Catholicism are. Catholics have a strict hierarchy with a Pope at the top and then bishops, archbishop, cardinals, archbishops, bishops, abbots, priests, you know, monks, all the way down to the bottom. And that's kings and queens like that. Kingdoms, monarchies like that. Queen Elizabeth, Mary, even Edward, it doesn't matter if you're how that's kind of the problem. Like if you're a Protestant king, um, 
your structure, your, your so social structure is the same as the structure as the church. So, you know, Catholic, Catholic hierarchy matches monarchy very well. That's why they got along so well for so long. So that's one issue that, you know, if you're going to be a Protestant king or queen, you're going to have to, you know, change some things because you're not the absolute power at the top the way the Pope is because that's Protestants don't believe that. All right. So when Henry tried to just say, OK, I'm the new Pope he kind of started a chain reaction because Protestants didn't like the Pope, but they also didn't like the hierarchy and all the other things about it too. But Henry did. The only thing he wanted to replace really was the Pope. Okay. Edward's different though. Edward wants to get rid of the uh, most of the other stuff too, because he grew up from a small boy being taught what's important to Protestants. So back to Catholics, there's a Pope at the top and there's a ranking through the church. And that's very important. Um, they conduct elaborate ceremonies. There's lots of decorations, um, celebrations, and festivals. They do rites and stuff. Um, they have sanctuaries, including gold and expensive things. Very ornate, very beautiful and artistic. Uh, those are the best churches to go to. Puritan churches aren't the most exciting things to look at. They just look like wooden boxes. If you want to see a really beautiful church, you go to a medieval Catholic church. And, and it is kind of, it almost blows your mind how much, you know, how much time, effort, money, um, expense went into this. And there's a little bit of hypocrisy there, obviously. So that's what they like. They like the house of God to be beautiful. They love the ceremonies, the festivals, the, the celebrations, um, the holidays. Uh, they worship the saints and uh, they believe in, you know, Virgin Mary interceding. They believe in praying to important uh, individuals that they will help you, you know, communicate things to God and help you be forgiven and perhaps even heal you uh, mentally, physically or emotionally. And of course, spiritually. Uh, the only Bible that's permitted is the one that's in Latin that was translated um, they, they use a certain translation that goes back um, and they rely strictly on that one, the Vulgate. Um, and also, because of that, even if you can understand Latin, uh, if you can read the Bible because you're a scholar, it's not your job to interpret what it means. Um, you have to be specially trained and you have to be a member of the church. So the only people who are supposed to really understand and interpret uh, the Bible itself are members of the clergy. Priests are trained to do that. Uh, normal people can't. They're not supposed to. Okay, on the other hand, Protestants reject most of these things. So the Protestant church, all of the Protestant churches, except for the, the case of England, because it's got the king at the head, but other, otherwise, the typical Protestant church is governed by a group some sort of council. And there are leaders amongst a group, but there's a moderator or a leader. Um, and and they, they, there's no one singular head of the church that lives there, is appointed, and then when they die, they're elected and replaced the way that the, the Pope, you know, inherits the position. They have councils and seminaries that have elected uh, members. Um, the emphasis they have on church is church should be focusing on just um, the meaning of praying and church. There shouldn't be distractions. Everything should be simple. So no, you know, fancy stuff on the walls and, and even, you know, you shouldn't be too comfortable. Your benches shouldn't have cushions or something. They should be hard so you can pay attention better. Okay. Um, so these sanctuaries, these churches are usually mostly plain and more functional. Um, you're not allowed to worship false idols as it says in the Bible, and you, so you can't have little, like a, you can't, some, there's some strange artifacts, like you have a, you know, a piece of um, cloth that belonged to uh, a saint or, or something even more spooky, like a, a finger or something like that, and they believe that they still had the, the spiritual essence, um, or it's a, you know, the Holy Grail, the cup that Jesus gro um, drank out of, none of that stuff is real. Uh, you can't go to shrines and pray, you can't pray to the, the saints. You have to read the Bible and pray dire directly to Jesus and God. 
Uh, anyone is allowed to interpret the Bible. You don't have to be a priest. Anybody has that right. And so the Bible should be written in the language that people understand, whatever language that is, English, German, French, Italian, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, etc. And those are the major differences. So that's what the Reformation means. Now, you can see they basically are opposites, right? Um, but there was no, at the beginning especially, there was no, like, they didn't separate neatly into different halves. So it was a big jumble of confusion. Some people wanted this and some people didn't like that. And so, of course, a lot of the English people were like, okay, you know, we don't need to follow the Pope, but we want everything else still. So what the problem that happened in England was, well, we had Edward, kind of super Protestant, and some people weren't okay with that. And so there was fighting between those groups. And then um, Mary reversed that. And you imagine how confused people were, like the, the, the Protestants were on the offensive and abusing and attacking and, and pushing the Catholics to behave differently. And then all of a sudden, the Catholics have a chance to get revenge. So, you know, people are burning and people are hiding and people are losing their jobs and going to jail. And then Mary dies and Queen Elizabeth is there. What's going to happen now? What side is she going to choose? Well, I think Queen Elizabeth, to me, may deserve the, t the title great. Um, maybe she didn't get it because she was a woman. Um, but along with Alfred the Great, who we don't know nearly as much about, Queen Elizabeth uh, accomplished things that a man would never have been able to accomplish. It's not just that she did well for a woman. Let's be clear, because we haven't had that many female um, heroes or leading figures thus far. There, there are some. I, I've skipped over a few that I could have talked about, but this is my favorite one. And I think she deserves maybe the most concentration on a course that's kind of watered down like this. Uh, this is something where I can say um, it's definitely early, early modern in the sense that there's, a, there's, there's so many things that are just on the edge of what we would be dealing with today. And we still deal with this, you know, um, this, this attitude um, built into our society that uh, there's a, a structural resistance to females having leading roles. Just look at, look at the numbers of CEOs or the difference in pay scale and stuff. We haven't overcome these things yet. Um, however, we have this this woman who, um, by all accounts, should have been eaten alive. She's 25 years old, stuck in a tower. They brought her out, surrounded by rich, powerful men, basically, that want to take advantage of her. How on earth did she manage to pull everything together? Um, also because the, the country's unstable. It's, half, it's confused. It's torn between uh, Catholic and and um, Protestant religion. Everything's unstable and into the middle of that situation walks Queen Elizabeth. I think she's one of the most fascinating individuals in England. Uh, she's one of the most fascinating people I've ever read about. I won't have enough time to do her justice, but I encourage you, um, watch the movies. Some things in the movies are really inaccurate. They do overdo it. They do exaggerate a lot of things. The truth is she was a bit of a nobody and she was shunted into the corner while she was young. And there was a, there was a good chance that she was going to get executed uh, just because her, her sister thought she might be a threat. So there wasn't a, she was an outsider from the beginning. But she, she possessed a truly amazing um, ability, a poise, um, uh, a confidence. Um, that, and, and some of these things are quite like her father, like Henry VIII. I would say... The main thing that she had, unlike her father, was she tended to be indecisive and, and hesitant, probably because she didn't, you know, unlike her father, she knew that if she just ordered somebody to die, that just wouldn't happen. So she took a different strategy. What she did is she just um, played everybody, uh, pl played 
everybody like a fiddle. It, it was like a giant game. She was a, she had her strings out everywhere and she she pulled here and and loosened here so that she kept a balance between all of the competing politicians in in uh, England. And they really didn't the only way that they could deal with her was was to sort of follow the path that the easy path that she gave them. So she just never let anyone get an advantage. So she, the way, just like, just like her, her father and her grandfather, the way to advance, the way to be successful in England at the time was to make the queen happy, right? What, to, to get close to the queen, to have her patronage, to have her support, and, and for her to make networking and connections um, and positions, appointments, um, and funds available for you was the way that you could succeed. And she did an, a remarkable job her entire life of balancing all these things. Now, in balancing all these things, she had to make some sacrifices. Um, it probably helped that she was young and beautiful. She, she did do a lot of um, enhancements. She knew everything about, you know, she, she appeared... Uh, majestic. She was carried around wearing gold and white and her, her, her uh, bright orange hair was always done nicely and, and she had jewels on. But she also went around uh, in villages. She was always moving and she always went to visit as many people as she could. Um, she was very smart politically. Um, she, sh she demonstrated to everybody that she cared but that they should treat her like some kind of special individual, almost like, you know, like the Virgin Mary, like, like a saintly individual, like she was above them, but she was willing to come down to them and mix with them. It's, it's, it's like a Jesus uh, or, or a Virgin Mary type uh, interaction with the people. And um, most, the, the common people were in love with her, essentially. She had them completely wrapped around her finger. So the way that she solved the Reformation problem was to compromise. I would just simply describe it like this. Uh, um, for the other Protestant religions, largely, you can just say Protestant is Protestant and Catholic is Catholic, but Anglican is in between because this is what it is. Anglican looks Catholic, but sounds Protestant. Okay? So they still have the bush, they still have the bishops, right? They, they still have the candles, they still have the bishops, they still have the ceremonies, they still have the queen at the top. The, the hierarchy and the structure is there. So on, on, if you look at the outside of it, some of the buildings still, until about 100 later, years later, they start smashing them and stuff. But largely, you know, um, they, they retain some of the ceremonies and everything, but you know, there's an English Bible and the, everything is simplified and the Pope is no longer um, involved. So you have, end up with this hybrid kind of church. So it looks, the structure of it and the appearance of it is Catholic, but the ideology, the focus on the Bible, you're allowed to read it yourself. The, the bishops are interacting with, with the congregations and leading the congregations and not, not uh, separated from them by... by uh, you know, special altars and tables and ornamentation. Um, the, pra the practice is more Protestant. So there, there's a, that's a compromise. Um, they still get to do their kind of rituals and everything. And f for the Catholics, that, that that's not good enough, then they have to sort of do their uh, Catholic um, ceremonies and masses separately in Latin. But officially, everything is Protestant uh, in practice and still keeps the sort of exterior of the Catholic Church. Okay, so that's the easiest way to, to understand it. Now, um, she is the last tutor. So we've gotten there. Now let's quickly, because my lecture is getting long and I, I want you to focus on this and not fall asleep because you need to know this stuff for the quiz. <clears throat> what happens when Elizabeth, when Mary dies, the connection between Spain cuts. Um, and when Elizabeth supports Protestantism, it makes it worse because Spain is a very powerful Spanish country. So over here on the right side, this is going to be after the quiz. Next week's lecture is going to be about the, 
the 17th century. And there's all kinds of things that happen, civil wars and kings get killed and stuff like that. Where they, those are the problems they have to deal with. But most of these problems start with Henry and, and they get worse. And then the, the kings and queens in the 17th century have to deal with them. So this is the brilliance too of Queen Elizabeth is that she is able to deal with them, right? So what she's doing to deal with the financial problem, it's difficult for her to tax people because she's a queen and she wants to be as popular as possible. Taxes make any leader unpopular. Her solution to that is just to, you know, change some fines here, give some monopolies, uh, give some people control over certain products, um, sell, sell little bits of land, um, make small little taxes, individual taxes like here, like uh, import taxes and stuff like that. She does as much as she can. Um, she charges people for offices and stuff like that, but that's not enough money. She's, she's still short and gradually as the Spanish realize that the English are not going to be their allies anymore, they start to shift towards neutral or, or hostile towards them. And this is a big problem because at this point, Spain is getting stronger and stronger and they've developed a, a global empire and England is still stuck in the corner on an island. So the solution that ends up happening is uh, it, through a combination of individual courage and, and um, you know, natural you know, inclination to the sea, some adventurers, sailors, soldiers, pirates, uh, whatever you want to call them, start trying to trade with the Spanish Empire. But the Spanish Empire is a closed system and it's illegal for English traders to enter their economic system. So they can't bring stuff from Africa, which is usually slaves, and we'll definitely talk about that later. But the slave trade is monopolized by the Portuguese and the Spanish. And any other goods that need to be taken back and forth which is a huge amount of money. This is enormous amounts of gold and silver uh, and spices and slaves and um, products, cloth, are being uh, transferred and it's making the Spanish incredibly rich. Uh, the French and the, the Dutch and the English all want some too. The only way they can do it is illegally. So, you know, officially uh, Queen Elizabeth is not in favor of piracy because she does not want to fight the Spanish. However, she needs money and so unofficially she says, um, go ahead and do it and I'll look the other way. But if you're successful in doing the trade and you need to give me some of the profit. So she cuts a deal with uh, certain guys, John Hawkins uh, and Sir Francis Drake, among many others, and uh, they, they smuggle. They smuggle slaves. Uh, they steal stuff and they trade, uh, but eventually the Spanish start getting sick of it and they, they accuse um, Elizabeth of supporting piracy. And she says, oh, no, no, I, I'm not doing anything. It's not my fault. But it escalates and it escalates. And then at a certain point, um, now nah, there's too much piracy going on and the, they're stealing too much and they're causing too much damage. And uh, King Philip decides that he's going to make it stop. Um, so he creates this gigantic fleet called the Spanish Armada, and this is one of the most famous events in um, European history and in world history as well. If I have a marker, I can write. I might not have a washable marker. I had one. It's 1588. It's a very famous date. There it is. So at this point... This is the Armada. Basically, at, at a certain point, about 10 years before that, Queen Elizabeth is not stupid. She knows the Spanish are coming for her. They're coming for, they want her dead, and, and they at least want someone friendly to Catholicism or to the Spanish in England. But basically, they, they want to eliminate the competition of the English. They don't want them stealing their uh, trade or, or damaging their trade. So they build this gigantic uh, fleet. <clears throat> um, however, they know that. So the English, through very careful saving and investment, 
um, and stealing. They do steal tons of gold and silver and precious goods from the Spanish. They manage to come up with their own fleet, almost the same size. Um, it's kind of a myth that the Spanish Armada was unstoppable and there was, it was so big that it, it was going to crush the English. But actually the, the English had better, faster ships. They had better sailors. They were better equipped. Uh, they had better leadership. The, the um, I'm not going to be able to remember his name, Medina, the, uh, uh, the Duke of Medina, I believe. I could be mistaken there. Might have to make a comment. Um, the most famous admiral in the Spanish fleet dies. And then six months later, he gets replaced. Uh, and the guy who goes on the, that leads the armada has never been on a ship. Doesn't know how to lead in our, the, these, this group of 160 ships at all. So they go from having their, a famous invincible uh, leader, one of the best admirals in Spanish history who, who has conquered all this... Uh, has defeated all these, won all these battles on the ocean. He dies and the, the king of Spain replaces him with somebody who is, yeah, incompetent. Has never even, has no idea what he's doing. And that's who, that's what goes up towards England. So it was never going to look very good. But what happened was they fought. Um, the the uh, Spanish ships were too slow, and they they were trying to get close so that they could their soldiers their soldiers could jump onto the ships and take the English ships, but they couldn't do that because the English were too fast and they had better guns, so they just shot at them until um, <clears throat> until they pushed them away from England. And in order to get away from the battle, uh, the winds were going the wrong direction, so they went north into the North Sea towards Sweden. Uh, to try and get back home to Spain, which is the wrong way if you look at the map. And they went around the top of Scotland and came back down around Ireland. And as they did that, a huge, you know, hurricane type storm came through and smashed them to bits. So only a fraction that incredibly expensive. It almost made the, the Spanish king broke building this thing. Uh, tens of thousands of, of um, people died, drowned. Um, killed and left for and landed on the beaches and were killed in Ireland and and very little of the Spanish Armada made it back and th what the the ships that made it back were basically useless because they were so damaged so it was a complete dis disaster and um, although m most of the credit should go to the bad quality of the Spanish ships the bad leadership um, the bad plan by the Spanish king um, and the effectiveness of the, the skill of the, the, the English sailors and the superiority of their ships, afterwards they they came up with this idea that it was God that was on their side, that the storm um, was sent by God to sweep away the Spanish invasion and that really God was a, a Protestant Englishman. And uh, so that started to give them this sense of, although they were the great underdog, um, Spain, Spain had more um, money and power, land, influence, uh, better skill in general, it was just a m much, much larger, powerful state that uh, England was capable of anything because God was be behind them. So they started to get this sense of destiny. And this, this uh, idea of this Protestant wind will, will come up several times over the next few lectures. And um, once we get to America, we will end up talking about the concept of manifest destiny, where Americans believed it was their destiny to create uh, a country that, that extended across the entire land as far as the eye could see to the to its very limit so these are very still it, it's still caught up in our culture today and that's why i said we're getting into stuff that is early modern because it's really closely connected to um, the way we look at things the way society is and ideas that people still hold today so um, this is the beginning of the empire here this is sort of one of the turning points you might say in the in the in the history of europe or in the history of england itself is the Spanish um, lose, they, they, they fight not just in 1588, but 
um, they fight again uh, multiple times. The English don't win every time, but the, the, the end result is Spanish uh, power on the sea, especially, and, and the empire's influence is uh, diminishing. It's peaked and it's diminishing and the power of the English, especially in the sea and as it expands, um, that's why I say inklings of empire, like little signs, little starts of empire. This is where people trace it back to, right back to, um, right back to Henry VIII trying to build a navy and not really doing a great job of it. But at this point, the English start to gain a superiority on the sea and they're going to struggle with the French and the Dutch and the Spanish for the next hundred years or so, but they're going to win the struggle and eventually they're going to come out on top. And this is fundamental to um, the reason why we have British culture all over the world is that um, the, the British culture became, it, it, it always was really closely connected to the sea, but it became, uh, it became essential to the expansion and the progress of the British culture, its, its superiority and its connection to the sea. It's an investment in the sea. So don't worry about these problems. Just I'm just saying you can see the struggles between who's can, in control, uh, the, the king, the queen, um, the nobles or parliaments. This is going to start to become a very serious problem. Uh, the kings and queens in England always have financial problems. So they're always looking for more ways to get money. Um, they're, they're often having trouble with France or Scotland or somebody else. Uh, the religion is all confused now, and that will continue to be a problem. And then the, the question of is, who's really in control? Is it the people that are in the, the city or the region, the county in Ireland or Scotland or the king in England? Who, who should have control over what? So keep these five points in mind, um, but those are not on the quiz. Uh, that's for content next week. Just you have to know up to the Spanish Armada and, you know, about Queen Elizabeth. So read up into that point in the book. Uh, Shakespeare I didn't do. I, w I meant to, but we're definitely, this is getting to be a long lecture. So if I can just find my spot here. Right up, stop on page 107, okay? So read up the, the Elizabethan age right there, 104, 105, 106, 107. Stop the English Renaissance, stop there. That's not uh, on the quiz. So quiz three is um, from the beginning of the chapter, kings, queens, and other things. It's about the Tudors. It's about Elizabeth and the Reformation. So just read that part, but stop on page 107. And that's the second lecture for this week to add to the earlier one. So maybe you might want to make some notes um, to refresh yourself since Chusak was uh, last week. But anyway, um, on Monday, we do have a quiz. Check the cyber lecture. Don't be late. Prepare yourself. Um, and I will see you again next week. Have a good day.